Hey, good afternoon, and welcome to this episode of Grab Bag. This is season four, episode two, and I'm your host, Rob Grandy, and we're really glad that you're with us today. Seriously, thank you for joining us. I feel like there should be some kind of song opening these things or something like that, but uh, the fact that you're here is just... Uh, very encouraging and I thank you very much for your attention. I hope that I'm not too confusing. You know, folks, I I don't have, I guess, you know, some, everybody wishes, if wishes were fishes, you know, and there are times that I wish that I was one of those golden throated orators that when I sat down and opened my mouth, the words just flowed so perfectly and the thoughts came out seamlessly, but that doesn't happen. And so I really appreciate your patience and your understanding. And I hope you can kind of sift your way through all that stuff and find some kernels of truth from the scripture uh, that encourage you in your faith walk. Will you do me a favor? Will you please hit the button below, giving us a record of your, not your belly button, the other one below on the computer, you know, the button that isn't really a button at all. Yeah, that one. And give us a record of your uh, registration or your attendance with us today. So a new ground rule for me. And uh, well, that's actually a ground rule like for you too. I'm setting, I have already set my timer and I've wasted a minute and a half, but I've set it for 30 minutes. And once that timer notifies me, I'm going to do my best to wrap a bow on this episode within the next five minutes after, and we'll pick up there on the next lesson. Boy, I keep scratching my face. Ooh. Boy, isn't that a distraction? I'm so sorry. So you got the idea that um, I'm trying to keep these things down and I'll kind of go by the timer. So let's jump in. Our last discussion was about the importance of context when we study scripture. And as we begin our study of John chapter six, let me provide a couple notes of context for this chapter. Though John doesn't mention it in his gospel account, Jesus' cousin, John the baptizer, had just been beheaded. And knowing how Jesus responded to the death of Lazarus with deep sorrow and tears, imagine how he is grieving the death of his cousin, John, as well as the one who was foreordained or specially chosen by God to prepare the way for Jesus. I mean, it was John who pointed literally and figuratively pointed people to Jesus. John tells us, the gospel writer John tells us that John, the, the baptizer, was the one who saw Jesus and pointed and told his disciples, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John was also the one who baptized Jesus at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. So now he's grieving, and you wonder how how and where can Jesus get away to find time to grieve in private? I mean, everywhere he goes, there's this onslaught of people that, that crowd him, that are anxious to get to him, that demand from him, that want from him. It's people that are concerned about themselves, you know, their health their well-being. They're not so much concerned about Jesus. They may not even know that Jesus is grieving. And so how, how does Jesus find time to grieve in private? You know, personal anecdote is that back in 1999, I was pastoring a church in Indiana. When my wife, Barbara, was um, diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I remember pointedly one evening, we were just laying on the bed in the bedroom and, and she was holding me and she said, who pastors the pastor? You know, she was concerned about me. 
She was like, you, you go out and you, you pastor other people, but who, who pastors you? And I think it's that way with Jesus. I mean, you're the son of God. Who pastors Jesus? Where does Jesus get time away to be alone or to speak in confidence to someone? Uh, I don't have any answer for that, but I just want you to understand the context that Jesus has a heavy, heavy heart. Remember John's purpose from chapter 20. He said, Jesus did a lot of signs, but the ones I've written about have been written so that people will believe and have salvation in his name. We got to always remember that's the overarching purpose and context in which John writes his gospel. So let's begin in chapter 6. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far side or the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. That was their motivation. John tells us this was their motivation. They followed because they saw the signs. You know, sign, sign, everywhere a sign, here's your sign. And they saw the signs, and so they were following. Jesus went up on a mill on a mountainside, a mill and a mountainside, and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. So immediately at the beginning of chapter six, we run into points of context. First of all, we're, you know, the Sea of Galilee. That's the, a given Jewish name, but John's gospel, as we talked about last lesson, was written with a Greek audience in mind. And so Sea of Tiberias is a name they would understand because that was a name uh, given out of honor and respect for the second emperor of Rome, Emperor Tiberius. So that, that was a name that they would recognize. Now they, they may, if they were nearby, have recognized the Sea of Galilee, but if they were from John, don't forget, John's writing a gospel that's going to be circulated. And so they may fix a location better by knowing the name Sea of Tiberias. Okay, you get the idea. He says that there were a great crowd of people in need. So that's context. Jesus went up onto a mountainside. And we don't have time to talk about this, but I'm going to mention if not, probably in the next lesson, that on the shore, particularly of the eastern side, of the northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee, the mountains went up high. And I'll give you some information on that in the next lesson. So, but there were, there were hills and there was a, it was a natural amphitheater kind of effect. So Jesus went up on the mountainside where there was... Uh, an ability for his voice to be heard. Um, and from what I've read, from what I've read, you could just talk, really, and you could be heard. You didn't have to shout, you didn't have to speak loudly, you didn't have to preach. You just had to talk. And your voice would carry all the way down to the lake. He says that they sat down. So we understand it's a calm setting. But, and he also says that the Passover festival was near. And we don't have time to explain the Passover. Um, if you don't know about the Passover, please check it out. Find out, go, go somewhere in, in Wikipedia, if anything, and find out what the Passover was all about. But what that means is that there are a lot of people heading south, heading to Jerusalem. And so it was probably these large crowds of people that had heard about Jesus and wanted to hear from him or see him. And, and so they came to Jesus. In verse 5, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, talk about hyperbole, another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. 
here is a boy with five barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place. Again, context. And they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Now, according to the other gospels, the disciples came to Jesus and they instructed Jesus in a few things. They said, send the people away into nearby towns to get food. Secondly, they are, we are in a secluded spot. And thirdly, the people are hungry. When I read that, I think, duh. You think Jesus is not perceptive of the fact that the people are hungry. We're in a secluded spot. They need to eat. We need to do something about it. Well, anyway, they decided they needed to school Jesus a little bit and tell him about all of this and about this situation. Well, we learn from the context of the Gospels that Jesus is located near Bethsaida on the far, it would be the northeastern side of the, the Sea of Galilee, Lake Tiberias. Well, guess who is from Bethsaida? Da -da -da -da. Philip. Philip is from Bethsaida. Now, we have an advantage of hindsight that Philip did not have in his foresight. Remember that Jesus, as the leader, was teaching the disciples collectively as well as individually. And it seems that Jesus decided it was Philip's turn for a pop quiz. And in the middle of the food problem discussion that he was having with the disciples, it seems like Jesus turns to Philip and says, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? That, that's very formal. I think it might have been something like, hey, Phil, what do you think? <laughs> Where are we going to buy enough bread for these people to eat? John writes in verse 6 that he, Jesus, asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. So Jesus is testing Philip's, but uh, Philip. Philip, but perhaps I think this was a fun test. And Jesus asks Philip, uh, where do we buy enough bread? Philip, you're from Bethsaida. Can you tell me what are some good diners around here? You know, what are some good bakery shops? Or is there any bakery shop that's set up enough to push out enough bread loaves to feed this crowd. The interesting thing is that Philip doesn't hear and focus on the where part of Jesus' question. Jesus said, where? Instead, Philip focuses on the buy part of the question. Where will we buy enough? And so he responds with an incredulity. It would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for every person to have just a bite. What are we going to do? <laughs> well, Jesus is a masterful teacher. He already knows. The Bible said he already knows his solution to the situation. But he wanted to use the situation to quiz Philip and maybe in a sense to get inside his mind to find out how are you thinking? What are you thinking in terms of spiritual answers? It, it's, it's a test I would guess that Philip probably would not understand till later. You know, later when he's maybe when they're sitting around laying around a campfire. And he's thinking back on what's happened and what Jesus has said. And he begins to process the whole thing. Or maybe even later when Jesus comes to him or he goes to Jesus and they have a little private conversation about, why, why did you ask me that question? Or, Philip, I want to tell you why I asked you that question. Because the Bible does say that at times when Jesus spoke in parables, 
that later he would explain the parables in a private setting to the disciples. And I, I think that may be a situation here. I, I don't know for sure. But Jesus is quizzing Philip, and he's not going to leave him hanging. Eventually, he's going to explain everything. But for now, Philip, where do we go? How do we handle this? Well, what lessons? Let, let's kind of stop here for a second. Here's a lesson. When God is involved, don't be confined in your thinking. Don't think bread by the slice or even by the loaf. Think bread by the factory full. Don't allow problems to shrink your faith and turn your focus to only earthly solutions. Don't let life jade your faith. Let's, you know, and sometimes in movies they have flashbacks. Well, well, let's jump back. This is from the first chapter of John, in verse 43. This is where Philip meets Jesus. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? <laughs> Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. Now, when you look back on that, Philip had such confidence in Jesus being the one Moses wrote about, whom the prophets wrote about. We found the Messiah. He was so confident of it that he decided to answer Jesus' call to follow him and to become a student, to become a disciple of Jesus. But he was also confident enough to go seek out Nathaniel, to brag on Jesus, and then to invite the sarcastic, skeptic, Nathaniel to come and meet Jesus. Wow. Well, now, back to the future. Was Jesus' test question designed to find out whether or not Philip still had that faith? Well, if it was, I don't know for sure. But if it was, it looks like Philip pulled a big major fail because he thought with the mind of earth in monetary terms and not the mind and the heart of heaven by thinking in faith terms. Look at John's later writing about a Philip and Jesus incident. John 14, six, we're familiar with these words. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? It's almost like another major fail. Because Philip is seeing through the eyes of his head and not through the eyes of faith. Jesus says, don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. So believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Jesus had to tell him, believe me. You know, where's your faith from when you first met me? What's happened? He says, and if you don't believe in me, now listen to this, at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Does that sound familiar? It should. Maybe, just maybe, that last sentence we read was brought to John's mind by the Holy Spirit when John was discovering the purpose of his gospel. These have been written so that you will believe that Jesus is a Christ. Maybe the Holy Spirit brought back to, that, to his mind that reprimand that Jesus had to give Philip. If you don't believe the words I'm saying, then believe 
because of the works you see. What had happened to the faithful exuberance and conviction of Philip's initial meeting with Jesus when he was convinced that Jesus was God's son? Okay, back to our text. Verse 8. Notice how I'm keeping this moving because that time is a going. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how will they go so far among so many? Another one who at least had a solution but was still wondering, you know, I'm looking through earthly thinking here, how, how's this going to help the problem? Andrew and his famous brother Peter were from Bethsaida, as was Philip. They were probably all friends through the fishing business, and Andrew presents an alternative answer, even though he does so skeptically. How far are these things going to go among so many? Maybe he was thinking, sheesh, if just one of these men makes a sandwich, it's all going to be gone, and then there's going to be a riot because everybody's going to want some, and they're going to be mad at that guy who ate it all. I, I don't know if that's what he was thinking. Mark writes that the discovery of loaves and fish by Andrew was because Jesus told them to do some investigation of resources. Jesus said, go find out what's available. Andrew brings back his find to Jesus, and, and, and at least it made me wonder, was that all that there was? Was the, was the little boy the only one with resources, or was the little boy the only one willing to share his resources? Hmm. Incidentally, Andrew was one of the disciples following John, the baptizer, when John pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. At that point, Andrew pursued Jesus with another disciple, whom I believe is John, the gospel writer, and Andrew asked Jesus, where are you staying? To which Jesus said, come and see. And after spending time with Jesus, Andrew went and got his brother, Peter. In scripture, interestingly enough, in scripture, Andrew is most often referred to as Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Peter gets all the press and he becomes a part of Jesus' inner circle. But what is cool is that every time Andrew is mentioned, as he is here and will be later in chapter 12, verses 21 and 22, for instance, Andrew is bringing someone to Jesus. <laughs> he was not a, a big player, you know, in the disciple scene, but he knew his mission and he carried out the purpose. In verse 11, Jesus took the loaves from Andrew. He gave thanks and he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. I just want to just simply point out, I think it's important. Jesus got the food and the first thing he did was he gave thanks. Do you give thanks to God before meals? Not only that, Jesus gave thanks in public. <gasps> Can you imagine that? Jesus giving thanks in public. Now, he wasn't even a, a designated religious official. He wasn't even a priest. But here he is in broad daylight thanking God for this bit of food that he had. What about us? You know, do we, do we shy away from giving thanks for our food? Shy away from giving thanks for our food in public? If you give thanks for your food, think about it. What does that say about you? What does it say about you in a relationship with God? What does it say about God? What does it say to the public that sees you giving thanks? What does it say to your family when you stop to give thanks before a meal? The Bible says that they distributed as much as they wanted. Folks, God is not a God of scarcity. God is a God of abundance, especially when it comes to love and grace. Remember in Ephesians chapter 2, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, 
made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God is not a God of scarcity. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. And so they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves they left over, or five barley loaves, I'm sorry, left over by those who had eaten. God is not a God of scarcity. He gives abundantly but he's also not a God of waste. <laughs> you know, God is a God of proper stewardship. And so here I go. I'm closing out. Look at that. I beat the timer so far. First of all, I want to emphasize again, remember context. When we're looking at the scripture, remember context. This week, I challenge you again to read John chapter 6. We're going to go to the next little section about the, the storm on the, on the sea as the disciples are in the boat. Read that through. Look for clues of context. Second thing, remember, God may test us. God may give us some what seem like exams that, you know, the kind you have to sit and spend hours working on because the test may be long. And he'll sit there and proctor it with us and he'll help us and he'll stay with us. It's a test we'd rather not have, but God wants to grow our faith. But sometimes the tests that come our way are just pop quizzes. Are we thinking earthly or are we thinking heavenly? Let's get our minds and our hearts on things above and allow God to lead us in our thinking not limited by earthly thinking as Philip was. Let's be mindful of our resources and trust God to work through us with those resources. In Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six. Well, okay, hold on a second. Yeah, okay. I thought maybe I had gone over ahead and set the timer. I have two and a half minutes. Well, I'll just slow down and talk a little slower. Okay. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't just lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. God gave you understanding. God gave you a brain, so use it. But at the same time, Lean on him. Bring him into all of your thinking, all of your decisions, and he will make your paths straight. Don't just think with an earthly mind. Think with a heavenly heart and a heavenly mind as well. A third thing I'd like you to remember is to be like Andrew. Bring people to Jesus. <laughs> you don't have to be a big church leader. You don't have to be a well-known, famous Jesus person, in your simple, quiet way, just bring people to Jesus. Direct them toward Jesus. When they ask for your help, you're serving them. Brag on Jesus. Unlike the commercial, I would ask you this. What's in your basket? <laughs> What's in your basket? What gifts and abilities has God given you that you can present to him, thank him for, and then watch him use to multiply the kingdom of God to serve people around you? Okay, there we go. I'm looking at 52 seconds left. So let me pray. God, I thank you for these folks who are so patient and kind and understanding of someone like me with who gets his tang all tangled up and gets in a hurry and um, 
Yeah, I thank you that um, we have a, a communication that is blessed by the Holy Spirit. And I ask that you would bless their lives and that they would see your purpose accomplished for them in their lives. Bless them richly as they ingest and take in your word, the bread of life. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. <laughs> uh, thank you for stepping in on this episode of Grab Bag, episode season four, episode number two. <laughs> Ciao.